This is Carlos Aliaga for the online radio show Lejos de la Multitud. And I'm talking today with Max de Charnet. Uh, I hope that I pronounce that I pronounced your surname correctly. It sounds yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that was very good. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. A musician who played with Nicky Southern, Gallon Drunk, The Earth of Sway, and The Flaming Stars, which, which yeah. sadly disbanded a couple of years ago. You're also a writer, a journalist, and you've been also been called a cultural curator. I love that title. <laughs> do yeah. you do you remember? I don't know what that means, <laughs> <laughs> but it seems it seems important and formal. Do you remember how you started with this interest? There was one that was before all the others, like music, or journalism, or writing. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Uh... I started playing the piano when I was four uh, and I started playing the drums when I was 11. Um, but I also, round about the time I started playing the drums, I, uh, there was a, a little old fashioned typewriter around our house and uh, I liked, I started writing stories on them. So, Ever since I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, I've been playing music and also writing things. Um, so for instance, by the time I got to college, and in England, you tend to go to college when you're like 18. And uh, um, I wasn't just going to see a lot of bands, I was also playing in bands. And, uh, but there was like a, a little newspaper at the, uh, a college newspaper and I started writing for that as well. So uh, um, I've been doing both things uh, at the same time, really. Um, but I didn't start writing for um, proper magazines as, as a journalist um, until the 1990s. Um, I started writing for some film magazines and then um, one day the film magazine I was writing for, they. Uh, I, I went into their offices in central London and it had just been closed down. The, the whole staff had just been told, you don't have a job anymore. Wow. And the company that was that owned that film magazine, it was a big one, it was called Neon, which is not the same magazine around these days called Neon, but it was, it was national. You know, you could buy it anywhere in shops and whatever in, in, in England. Uh, <clears throat> but they were on the same corridor as another magazine that uh, the same company owned, and that was Mojo. So uh, I didn't really think much about this. The day I was there being told, right, everybody's just been given the sack, I thought, okay. And I walked down the corridor, and I knocked on the door of Mojo, and I said, hey, I'm, you know, I've been writing for they, those people, and they've finished. And they knew who I was because they knew me from Gallon Drunk and they knew me from uh, uh, The Flaming Stars, but I'd never met them before. Um, and I said, uh, can I write something for you? And they said, well, come up with some ideas. And you know, if, if you're sitting there as, as a writer and somebody immediately says, give me, give me five good ideas for, for an article. Yes. And, and at that time we were, In the Flaming Stars, this is 1998, we were recording our album Pathway at Pathway Studios. And um, you probably saw I put some stuff up about Pathway Studios the other day on my Facebook site, and we were talking about that. And the guy that built Pathway Studios and still owned it in those days, he was a fascinating guy because he, he wrote, co-wrote the song um, Fire for the crazy world of Arthur Brown, 1969, which was a number one hit in England and a number one hit in America. So he made a lot of money and he, he used that money to build this recording studio. And so if you go forward five years from him building the studio, you've then got Chiswick Records recording their early punk stuff. There's Stiff Records recording like the first Damned album, the first Elvis Costello album whole wide world by Reckless Eric, you know, it's just all these great records coming out of this tiny, really, really small studio. And it hadn't changed. It looked exactly the same. So I, I immediately said to Mojo, well, look, 
we're recording at Pathway. I know the guy who owns it. I've been talking to him a lot about this story. Would you want an article about that? And they said, yeah. And so the first thing I ever did for them was two pages of Mojo, all about the history of, of that. And then I just kept coming up with ideas. And uh, so that's 23 years I've been writing for them just because I walked through the door and, you know, said hello, basically. It's, it's, so, it's, it's so, such, a, such a good story. And I, 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 I was very lucky. Very lucky. And I was worried, no, no, and I was thinking, I, I, I would love that uh, all, all journalists could get a job so, so easily that my life would be easier that way. Well, I, I have to say, I've been writing for, magaz for small magazines without getting paid for nearly 20 years by that stage. You know, starting with magazines at college and then lots of magazines in the 1980s where I was just pleased to see my, see my work in print, but I, I didn't get paid. So uh, usually I wrote about the same things I write about now, which is uh, the history of film, cinema, the history of music, and, and just pop culture generally, you know, um, uh, youth movements, punk rock, garage rock, uh, ordinary people, really. I, I'm, I'm not that interested in... Uh, um, the history of rich politicians and what they've done over the years. I don't care. Um, but to me, it's um, artists, photographers, writers, musicians, actors, actresses, um, anybody who's doing something to try and cheer us, cheer us all up, you know, just entertain us or make the world a bit more interesting. That, that is that is so fascinating and at the same time time I don't know if this is the right uh, word daunting because I don't know exactly how to approach you like uh, he's he's a drummer he's a you know so, so much avenues so I'm I'm going to ask you uh, to keep to keep it to keep it in order um, you you wrote books and you've been inspired by punk and glam and the classic rock and roll which one yeah. of, of those styles you discovered first? Um, classic rock and roll because my uh, uh, my parents were teenagers in the 1950s, so they were all all my you know my father and my uncles and my aunts. These were the kind of people who went to see Bill Haley when he came and played over here, or or bought Jerry Lee Lewis records, uh, or you know, so if anything like that was on television back when I was a kid, uh, when we only had, there were only two television channels, BBC and ITV, that was it. And they would often show Elvis films, you know, Jailhouse Rock, things like that. They'd show Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock film. And so, yeah, I can just remember watching those kind of things when I was five years old. And, uh, I like that music. I mean, I'm old enough to have lived through the 60s, but I didn't like, uh, I've never liked, I like short, short songs. I don't like 10 hour guitar solos and, and uh, you, you know, that sort of, um, the, the hippie thing never, <laughs> it, it never appealed to me. So there will never uh, appear a, a picture of you on, on Facebook with long hair like uh, when Jello... No, I, I, I've never, I've never had long hair, um, <laughs> and in the in the sixties, sorry, in the seventies at my school, particularly the early seventies, you know, once a year they would they would get you together for a class photograph, which nobody wanted, and everybody's sitting there going, oh God, how, no, when's this going to finish? And most of my friends had got, you know, nineteen seventy four, whatever, they've got hair down, uh, but. My hair has always been pretty curly, and I never liked that. And I realized that if I grew it long, it wouldn't go like this. It would go like that. <laughs> but it would be such, it would be like, I don't know if it was Jerry Rubin. There is one GP who had a, such a great uh, afro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the best, the very best it could possibly have been would be Mark Bolan or 
yes. or Ian, Hunt, Ian Hunter from Mott the Fruitful. But um, with my luck, I'd have looked like, um, I don't know, one of the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. <laughs> Or, or, or like the one that uh, the MC5's uh, lead singer, I don't remember his name, sorry. He yeah, had, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, uh, Rob, Rob Tyner. Yeah. Thank, thank, you very, thank you very much. But, but, but uh, yeah, that would be us. He was deliberately trying to look like friends of his who were in the Black Panthers and yes, stuff like that. that yes. was, I was a very political haircut you got there. Ah, that, 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 that is a good, you, you, you have so, uh, you, you manage uh, also to, to balance all uh, interesting facts in, in, in the books, at least the, 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 the few books uh, that I've uh, read about uh, that you wrote. So um, uh, also you were talking about that you don't like uh, those long, very uh, intricate songs, uh, but I read uh, the review you did on a book about Dave Brubeck. And, yeah. I and I remember a song by the Flaming Stars called Baby Steps, which I assume is a reference to Giant Steps by John Coltrane. Uh, I hope I'm, I'm right. Uh, I, I like, yeah, I like yeah. John Coltrane. I mean, if, if... Uh, Do you have uh, some favorite jazz artists? In, in yeah, your yeah, um, absolutely. Um, Art Pepper, uh, Chet Baker. Yeah, love um, them, love them. And uh, uh, Jerry Mulligan, people like that. Uh, my favorite... 50s jazz album is is called Art Pepper Meets the Rhythm Section. Which yes, I, I have it. I have it. I have it. Yeah, uh, that I can listen to all day. Uh, that and uh, I, but I, I I do I like a lot of 1920s and 1930s uh, jazz. Uh, a lot of original uh, New Orleans and, and Chicago and and. Uh, And New York, I mean, a lot of that stuff came out of New York. That's where the recording was. Um, so, yeah, I, I love all, all, all of those kind of people. The early Louis Armstrong, Big Spider Becker, people like that. Um, and the bits where it's difficult to tell, is it jazz or is it blues? Um, you know, some people get called both at the same time. Um, a lot of the boogie woogie people, um, Albert Ammons, Mead Lux Lewis, uh, Pete Johnson, Uh, but um, I, I like music that that goes somewhere, mm -hmm. and um, I, I don't like somebody just setting up a groove. And you could go out, you could go out for a walk and come back half an hour later, and it sounds like you haven't missed anything. Um, ah. uh, whereas the, I think uh, the reason short records is uh, look at the first Ramones album everything's like one minute 30 two minutes you know just bang 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 I, I saw the Ramones in 1977 I might have mentioned this to you before the the famous yeah. the, the famous oh. show it's alive that that show uh, no, at the no, rainbow no. Uh, yeah. you, you didn't mention, but I was going to ask you if you had the chance to see the great the, the, the great 77 punk bands I was going to ask you yeah. some yeah yeah I Uh, I saw the Ramones on New Year's Eve at the Rainbow in 1977 here in London. And that is the album that came out two years later was recorded that night. And that's the double album called It's Alive. Yes. And they filmed, they filmed most of it. It's not the whole show, but the video you can get has got them doing maybe 20 songs. I think they played 36 songs that night. Wow. In just over an hour. <laughs> I And... Have I have the I have the vinyl. It's it's like my favorite Ramones, and I was uh, talking with with other people, and it's perhaps one of the best live albums ever because it's such such an intensity, at least for that yeah. moment. It's 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 the best gig I ever saw in my life, and uh, it's um, I saw them seven times altogether between 1977 and about 1983. So all the other times it was um, Marky playing drums. Mm -hmm. But uh, in 77, it was Tommy. That was the original oh. four. So I saw them once with Tommy. And I'd seen Marky before he joined the Ramones because I saw Richard Hell and the Voidoids um, about six months after I saw the Ramones. And so Marky was playing drums with them. And God, Richard Hell, uh, he was stunning. Uh, wow. Absolutely stunning. Um, I saw most 
most people in those days, not everybody. Uh, the Buzzcocks in 19, March 1978, uh, just after, just between What Do I Get and I Don't Mind. And they, that is probably the second best gig I ever saw in my life. They were incredible. Um, and they were supported by the Slits. Um, and then later that year, this is still 1978, I saw The Clash. They were supported by the Slits. The Slits, had, the Slits had a lot of friends. <laughs> you saw you saw the clash did you saw the clash that's that's where you get the yeah. sandinista social club reference yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah was, that was that was the album that was their second album i i, I saw that when that was when um give them enough rope had just come out so that's december 1978 i saw x-ray specs when they first they just got one single wow 1977, uh, Oh Bondage Up Yours have been out for about two weeks. And there was maybe 50 people in the audience. Um, that was great. Uh, I don't know, I saw Wayne County in the Electric Chairs when Fuck Off was their new single. Um, Sham 69 before they got, uh, before they turned into what they, <laughs> they had. I saw them when they'd, they'd only got two singles. It's the tour for their second single, which is called Borstal Breakout, which I yes. think is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's a great single. Uh, I'm, great single. We, will, we will be talking about, because you are telling me uh, about bands that I love, and I'm also a bootleg collector. I mean, I don't buy them because of the, because of the rarity. It's because in, in Chile, we, we never had the chance to experience all those great bands. I mean, I saw, mm -hmm. I saw the Ramones, but it was like in 1992. So it, w it will be a very different experience. I saw the Bascocks like in uh, 2010, and yeah. it, it will be a different experience. But for us, it was great. So it was, it was great. Sorry, my, my, my English is, is rusty. Yeah. I, I never yeah. speak good, English. Good. Um, also, Uh, so, so listening to those bootlegs, uh, uh, it gives me some sense of how it was to be uh, listening to, no. I don't know, uh, bands that uh, are, are not possible to see now, like uh, The Clash. I, I'll, I'll never have the chance to see The Clash. Okay. I'm, yeah. I was also going to ask you, um, uh, in 1994, you started The Flaming Stars, uh, which yeah. re recorded in the studios Pathway and Tom Rack, <laughs> you told me a funny, yeah. st I remember a very funny story that is, uh, I don't remember which one of those two studios uh, were getting their equipment uh, from the other uh, studios that were throwing them out to the garbage, something like that. Yeah, that's, that's Tom Rack. Because um, um, <clears throat> we only did one record at Pathway and that was in 1998, but, but from 1992 onwards, just when Torag opened up, we started recording there, first of all, uh, in the Earls of Suave. <clears throat> and the first Earls of Suave single is the first piece of vinyl that ever appeared from the Torag studio. Uh, okay. uh, hundreds of people have recorded at Torag over the years. It's still a very successful studio, um, but we had the first single. Um, and uh, yeah, Liam, Liam Watson, who, Torag is his studio to this to this day, and he had been going around in the late 80s at a time when the big the big studios and the big record companies they were in love with digital. You know, they wanted vinyl to be to stop. They wanted to sell everybody CDs, and once you had <clears throat> digital recording equipment, which had been around since the late 70s but it was really really everywhere by the late 80s they were ripping out all this beautiful analog gear from studios like Decca and abbey road and and uh, i think i mentioned when we spoke last the main desk at toe rag came out of a small studio in the east end of london and that is the one that ian dury and the blockheads first album was done through wow. uh, the wow. the album new boots and panties so All the, most of the Flaming Stars records were recorded through that desk. And if you have a look, maybe two months ago, I put up a photograph of myself standing by the desk in the control room at Torag. Uh, that control desk is the one I'm talking about. Yes. 
and it's small. It's it's an eight it's an eight track desk, you know, because um, everybody everybody got obsessed with the idea. The more technology came along, it's it used to be a luxury. Uh, well, Eddie Cochran was radical for recording on two tracks in uh, 1958, 1959. Eddie Cochran's records, often he's playing most of the instruments. He was overdubbing, and that was that was really radical for the 1950s. By the time you get to the Beatles, and I'm not a Beatles fan, but that technologically, the, the one reason people go on about Sgt. Pepper is because it was done on a four track, and that was big news to have four tracks in 1967 um, by the by the time they built pathway you've got an eight track desk five years later um, and then the really professional people they were using 24 track desks by about 90 end of the 70s beginning of the 80s um, and the trouble is if you keep piling on instruments say you've recorded a really good backing track it's very tempting if you've got another 50 tracks for the guitar player to say, I'm going to put another guitar track down and another guitar track down. And in the end, you wind up with a sludge. You know, it's just, you can't hear anything. My favorite Sex Pistols recordings are the early demos. Yes. The ones, the, the bootleg called Spunk, Spunk. Which, they, which Dave Goodman recorded because there's just one guitar track on them. Whereas on Never Mind the Bollocks, um, you've got guitar, you, you've got bass, drums, and vocal, and then you, on the rest of the 16 tracks that they had, you've got Steve Jones putting about 12, he, there's layers of guitar. I didn't he know that. It. Yeah. Whereas if you just hear the one guitar, which you get on the, the bootlegs or on, on, on Spunk, you can really hear what a great guitar player he is, because you can hear the individual Yes, uh, you know what he's I'm, doing with his hands. I'm gonna I don't go, know. I'm gonna go and listen to to, to that bootleg again with that information yeah. because it, it's fascinating. Yeah. I, I, I didn't knew that the Sex Pistol did that. Also, um, you, uh, talking about the same the same thing uh, in an interview with the German magazine Ox, you said, and I hope that I did a correct translation because I don't know how to speak German. Uh, here it is. Uh, we believe that music shouldn't sound too clean. If you polish the sound too much while producing, the music will no longer sound, sound like it was man-made. We still want yeah. to leave rough edges. The, tensions, the tension has to be maintained. It, that's sort, sort of your yeah. philosophy uh, for, for yeah. recording. Definitely. And I think a lot of my favorite records from history from from other people that i enjoy listening to there's a few of them they've got big mistakes in them and it doesn't matter um a lot of what uh, well sam phillips sun records was a genius at recording i mean who did he discover you know elvis jerry lee roy orbison johnny cash bb king um you know it just goes on and some of those records are out of tune because the band Uh, Billy Lee Riley and the Little Green Men. Uh, he gave interviews later. You know, his big hit was called Flying Saucers Rock and Roll. And he said that they were drunk. They were absolutely drunk when they were recording most of those. I, I interviewed Sonny Burgess, who made a wonderful rockabilly single called We Want a Boogie. And um, they, they, he told me that they were, you know, they had moonshine whiskey and they were very, very drunk when they were doing that. Because what, what Sam in the recording studio, what he wanted was how does it feel? Does it sound like something? And, and certainly We Want a Boogie, is, is, it's out of tune, it's sliding about all over the place, and it's perfect, it's absolutely perfect. Um, Louie Louie by The Kingsman, which is a work of genius, um, that's got a huge mistake in the middle of it, which um, anybody who's into garage music absolutely loves because you've got There, there's a guitar, there's a, an instrumental break, and then the vocalist he comes in one bar too early, oh. and you hear him go, you hear him go, good night, and, and he's trying to sing uh, Me See Jamaica Moon Above, and he, you hear him go, and then the drummer hits a few things, telling him to shut up, and then they go around one more bar, and then he comes, 
stuck in. Now, most people would have just gone back to the beginning and said, we've ruined that take, let's do it again. But the actual, that record just, it's just got something. It's, it's so powerful. And in those days, they had the good sense not to go back and do it again, but to say, that's good, we're putting that out. That's, that's a to, sorry. Well, to me, that, because I was, I was a teenage uh, punk, punk rocker, you know, punk came along when I was 16, first Ramones album, and, uh, you know, that was the whole philosophy was, don't clean it up, uh, maybe just record it in five minutes on a cassette in, in the corner of your, literally in the corner of your garage. Um, and uh, who cares if, it's, if it sounds loud and dirty or exciting, then who cares if it's got tape hiss on it or, or if a chair fell over in the background, um, doesn't matter. That's, no that's sure. uh, maybe uh, that's the reason why I love uh, bootlegs because in the bootlegs you, you capture some sort of energy that is not available. Like I, my, my ear uh, knows that uh, there's in some ways cheating, but when they play live and you say, wow, Uh, this band, I don't know which band, uh, they, they were better uh, live and more yes. energy. Another, yes. another product, I, I don't know how to say it. Um, yeah. You also shared this, um, uh, I mean, uh, James from Gallon Drunk also shared this philosophy because you told me some story about the recording of the song, Some, some Fools. Some, yeah. Can you give me that anecdote, please? Because well, it was. Okay. Um, There's a, there used to be a small, it was basically a rehearsal studio underneath, the, you know, the railway arches. When you've got a railway bridge and big old Victorian railway arches, just by the entrance to, it's part of Waterloo Station in central London on the South Bank. And they'd used some of these arches for rehearsal space, but uh, it was a place called Alaska. And, uh, but there was also a cheap recording studio in there very, very basic, a small room, probably about the size of this room I'm in at the moment. And we were recording there. Uh, and that was the first single I recorded with Gallon Drunk. And this is what you get when you're all playing at once. Whereas a lot of bands, they go in and they have a computerized click track, you know, so the drummer sits there following his headphones. So it's dead before you've even started. It's, it doesn't breathe. It doesn't have any human thing to it. But, and then they build things up, up afterwards, each person playing individually. Whereas if you all play together and somebody makes a mistake, you can think to yourself, okay, it's a mistake, but let's keep going. And then you go back and listen to it afterwards. And it's always worth getting to the end of the song and then deciding whether you think it was any good or not. So we're halfway through playing Some Fool's Mess. We didn't really know how to play the song. It was brand new. And uh, James was playing the guitar and his guitar strap, uh, it, I say it broke, it really it just, it came out of the little uh, piece of metal that was holding it. Yes. So the guitar fell off, hit the floor. And if you listen to the recording, you can hear His, his guitar, the noise of his guitar just stops, but then you can hear this heavy thing hitting the floor. Uh -huh. And the bass player, Mike, stopped playing because he thought, okay, that's it. It's all over. And Joe on the Maracas stopped playing. And there was only the four of us. It's just guitar, bass, Maracas, and me on the drums. Um, and I kept playing. Um, and because I thought it was sounding good, And then James sort of picked up his guitar and put it back on. And because I was still going, after a few bars, Mike came back in on the bass. And then a couple of bars later, um, James and Joe on the Maracas uh, joined back in. And uh, that's it. So you've got this dramatic instrumental breakdown in the middle um, that ever since, uh, to this day, if there's ever a gallon drunk kick, that's the way people play that song doesn't matter who's on drums or who's in the band. There's been a lot of people in the band over the years, but um, it, right from that moment, we then played the song that way. 
And uh, that's it. So it's a four and a half minute song and it took us four and a half minutes to record it. And uh, yeah, uh, you don't get that if you're, if you're overdubbing. So yes. Uh, I, another favorite, I, I, I did some gigs with the Cramps. Um, I, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, um, 1991, they did uh, five shows in a row leading up to Halloween uh, in London at a place called the Town and Country Club. These days it's called The Forum, it's still there. <laughs> and um, there were different support bands every night. Mm -hmm. And the day before Halloween, I was in the support band and that was um, the Earls of Suave. So we were the opening act and in the middle was one of the great original 1950s rockabillies, which is uh, Ronnie Dawson guy who did Rockin' Bones. So you've got us, then you've got Ronnie Bo Dawson, then you've got the Cramps. That's not, not a bad evening. Yes. And then, then the following night, um, I was, I can't remember who opened the, the bill, but then I was playing in the middle uh, as the drummer in Gallon Drunk, and then it was the Cramps. And that was because it was Halloween. Uh, my friend Bal, who was the singer in uh, uh, The Earls of Suave, um, he had uh, a coffin, a full-size coffin, uh, uh, that he just had it hanging around, you know, it was, it was a, like a, a film prop, you know, it wasn't a real one, nobody had ever been buried. Ah, in. okay, I was going to ask you if it was a real coffin. But, no, um, <laughs> but it, it, I think it was made for a feature film or something. But, you know, it was life-size, and uh, so he lent it to Lux, and because it was Halloween, so the cramps that night, they started it, uh, this was a tribute, really, I suppose, to Screaming Jay Hawkins. Yes. And, uh, so, you know, the, the curtains opened and there's the three members of the band and then there's a coffin where the vocals are. <laughs> and, and then Lux, <laughs> Lux came out of that. I wish, uh, I, I wish there were videos of, of, of that evening. That would be yeah. awesome. Well, the, the, uh, the night before, the Earls of Suave night, because um, Lux had a 3D camera. It wasn't a 3D film camera it was a i think it was a vintage 1960s 3d stills camera and we're trying to do our gig to 2000 cramps fans who basically are waiting for the cramps to come along and uh um mostly bal was the singer in the else well, but i would sing a couple of songs and i used to do uh in dreams the great roy orbison song mm -hmm. and uh if you've ever tried to sing I mean, I don't sing it anywhere. Nobody sings it like Roy Orbison. It's just not possible. But if you've ever tried singing in dreams to 2,000 screaming cramps fans, while over in the, at the side of the stage, the, the audience can't see it, but I can see it, is all of the cramps with um, Lux taking loads of pictures on his 3D camera. <laughs> I'm trying to concentrate on not making a complete idiot of myself. <laughs> hitting the wrong notes those were those were great evenings and the cramps were such such nice people really really um friendly and uh yeah they were everything you would want them to be they were, they were wonderful people that is so that is so wonderful i, I was going to ask you about that um um I'm going to, to jump to another thing, uh, to another question, because I have them in, in some sort of order. Um, from, from what I understand, uh, the support of people like John Peel and a label like Vinyl Japan were very important to keep the Flaming Stars touring and releasing records. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Could, you, could you tell me uh, more about the reasons that led to the end of the band? I, I think that there is some important lessons uh, to be learned from, from, from those and well, reasons. Yeah, I suppose the thing is, you couldn't, John Peel, you can't replace John Peel. He was completely independent. He'd been with the BBC, with Radio One, ever since Radio One started in 1967. And so normally the way a radio show goes in this country is you have the DJ, and you have the producer who's in charge of the show. And often, 
the DJ is not playing records that they have chosen themselves. They're being told what to play by the producer. That never happened with John Peel. John Peel only ever played things that he liked. And for instance, he was a, he was a big friend in the late 1960s of Mark Boland. They, him, they, them and their two wives were, they spent a lot of time together. And then when Mark Bolan finished with Tyrannosaurus Rex and started doing the T-Rex stuff, um, and I, I knew John and I, I interviewed John and he told me that, you know, there was just one day in the early days of T-Rex where Mark sent in the new T-Rex single and John thought to himself, if I wasn't friends with this guy, would I play it? And he thought, no, because I don't like it. Now, I mean, I'm the biggest T-Rex fan in the world, so I don't understand it. But John thought, and so he didn't play the new T-Rex record and he didn't play the next one. And Bolan never spoke to him again. He just thought, he felt really hurt by that. He thought, you're my friend and you're not playing my records on the radio. But oh. for, John, for John, the idea was, he's only gonna play records that he thinks are good music. And just because a band might have done um, 10 records he liked, if the 11th record was one he didn't like, he wasn't gonna play it. I didn't know and that. Wow. So when, when I was in Gallon Drunk, we did a John Peel session in uh, the summer of 1991. And that's the only John Peel session because it was always John, he would ask you, do you want? And that's the only one he ever wanted Gallon Drunk to do. So I don't know why, but that's that was his decision. Um, and so when we started The Flaming Stars, three years later, I, I didn't think, okay, we've got The Flaming Stars, so naturally John will play our records. That I knew it didn't work like that, but we sent him the record and uh, I, I always used to listen to his show and I noticed that he was playing uh, Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye on, off the first EP. He played it almost every night. So I managed to find a phone number for his producer, uh, which was the only way I could think of getting in touch. And I said, can you ask John, he seems to like that record. I'm really pleased about that. Would he be interested in us doing a, a session? And she said, well, look, I'll ask him. He'll either say yes or he'll say no. And a couple of days later, she rang me back and said, yep, come and do a session. And then every, I don't know, every six months or eight months, they would get in touch and say, do you want to do another session? So we did eight sessions for him. And each time we put a record out, and a new album, if John played it, I would think to myself, great, that means he still likes us. Because there's, there was no guarantees that just because he played us before. Um, so I can't tell you how much, that's how much we owe him. He, he played us on the radio so many times between 1995, the first single came out in Easter 1995. Um, up till then, until he died 10 years later, um, he never stopped playing us. And as soon as he did, as soon as he wasn't there anymore, for obviously tragic reasons of him dying, um, that's it. We never got on the radio anymore. We do occasionally get on British radio, but nothing compared to what it used to be. And the same with Vinyl Japan. Vinyl Japan put out our first single, the one that John started playing, and they went on putting our records out until I think 2003, something like that. And then the record company went out of business. So, and one of the main reasons they went out of business was the reason why a lot of other small labels went out of business. We might've spoken about this before, is that basically the internet came along. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people who, they might in the 1990s have gone and bought your record, but now they could uh, illegally download it for nothing. And so instead of, no, nobody on Vinyl Japan was selling, you know, a big selling album was maybe 3,000 copies if you were doing really, really well. And that's worldwide. So if you've got any of our records on vinyl, there's not many of them about, you know. Most of 
most of the uh, most of the albums. I like have that. this. I have this one. Yeah. <laughs> that is very rare. There are one thousand copies of that. In the whole yeah, world. it's it's very rare. A friend brought brought yeah. uh, brought this one from London to Chile, so yeah. it's my treasure. It's my treasure. Yeah. Well, you as I say, you you have. You have probably one of the only ones in South America, I would, I would think. Probably. Most, most of them sold here and in Germany uh -huh. and, uh, and some in France and stuff uh, and in a bit in America. But I think most of them are probably still here and it doesn't, it doesn't come up for sale very often. Um, yes, I know. And of course, but in selling maybe 3,000 copies of a record, a thousand vinyl and maybe two thousand CDs. The record company made enough of a profit that they could then afford to give us a little bit of money to go and make the next record. By the time it got to say two thousand and one, two thousand and two, um, because of internet downloading, um, these records were lucky to sell more like a thousand copies. So instead of making a profit, a, a small profit, they made a small loss. So in the end, the record company went out of business. And so it became this thing, unless you were the kind of band that one of the major record labels like uh, EMI or Sony or somebody like that, unless they were going to come and think that they could sell at least maybe 30 or 40,000 copies of a record or maybe 100,000 copies, they didn't want to touch you. So a lot of my friends who were also in bands, um, that's where their dealings with record companies stopped. If they've made a record since then, you may have noticed how many musicians are putting their own records out on their own label these days. Yes. Whereas in the 1990s, all of my mates who were recording like us at Toreg Studios, we were all on so many different labels that were just small labels, either from England or um, France or Spain or Germany. And these people managed, those labels managed to do stuff and they could make a little bit of money, but mostly the next record, sorry, the last record paid for the next record. You know? It worked. Um, so it's, it's a bit like the same, if you look at the history of, of uh, horror films and science fiction films. Yes. All the, um, the great cheap films, like the Roger Corman stuff from the late 50s, those things were made for no money at all. You know, the, the cheap rock and roll films and things like Attack of the 50 Foot Woman or Attack of the Giant Leeches. They could make a film for $10 and send it around, there was a big circuit of uh, all the drive-in cinemas in the southern states of America. And people would go and see anything because teenagers, they didn't even want to see the film. They just wanted to go and park in the drive-in cinema and get up to something else on the back seat <laughs> while the film was going on. So if it was a film, you know, get away from your parents because you don't have a, you can't do this at home. Yeah. So if the film was called Teenage Caveman or if it was called teenagers from outer space or, you know, I married, a, you know, I married a communist for the FBI or whatever. Great. That sounds like fun. <laughs> and so, you know, Roger Corman, he wrote a very entertaining autobiography about 30 years ago. And um, he said you, it was just a license to print money. You could shoot a film in 48 hours, you know, two days on in black and white. Stuff like Little Shop, Little Shop of Horrors, the original one. I think that was shot in a weekend. And, uh, you know, Ed Wood, all of his stuff. But these things actually made money. Made money, Incredible. yes, yeah. yes. And, and uh, the, uh, in, the punk, in the punk days, if you were smart enough to make a DIY single, do-it-yourself single in 1977 over here, you could walk into the rough trade shop in West London mm -hmm. And they would buy a box of them, you know, 25 copies mm -hmm. without even listening to it because they knew they could sell anything because that was the trendy thing. Oh, this is, you know, um, 
uh, Happy Birthday Sweet Sixteen by Clive Pig and the Hope of China. You would think I'm making this up, but I, I'm not. <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you, you know too much records to, to be to, to be creating yeah. names, but uh, or, or Drums Over London by the Disco Zombies. You know, <laughs> you would, the people who are into that stuff, you would, um, uh, you know, if if it was completely obscure and you knew there were only 500 copies of it and the sleeve was just a folded piece of paper like the original version of Teenage Kicks on, uh, by the undertones on the, uh, um, oh God. Good, good Vibrations. Good Vibrations good label, vibrations. yeah. Um, you know, that is just Terry Hooley, uh, who ran it, just doing it the cheapest way possible. Uh, and he's a great man. I, uh, I met him at, I think, a Gallon Drunk show many years ago and spent a very entertaining evening getting drunk with him. He's a wonderful man. I saw a movie about his life. It, it, yes, it, 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 it's, a, it's a very inspiring movie. I, I really like that, that one. That's a, great, that's a great film. Yeah, yeah. And it's a really, really good film. And, was... uh, but, but yeah, why did I mention the punk singers? It's because in 77, you could sell anything that was do it yourself and in a picture sleeve. By 1979, you would walk into the rough trade shop And they go, sorry, mate, we've got so many of these things. Um, everybody was doing it. So, uh, and I think the people buying the records, they'd all bought one too many records that were either not very good mm -hmm. or were actually made by old hippies pretending <laughs> to be punks. Like that guy, that guy from the police, yeah. Stuart Copeland. You know, Stuart Copeland was an old hippie, but he made, he made, um, no, he'd been, he'd been in long haired bands in like 1970 yeah. and whatever. I was thinking uh, about, I was thinking that you were going to mention Penny Rambeau, but, but at least he was, uh, he was um, sure. honest. Yeah. He, he did yeah. something, he gave something back. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. No, but what I meant was that they would put these things out under another name. He put, uh, Stuart Copeland put out a couple of singles under the name Clark Kent. And uh, ah. they, were in, they were in green vinyl to get everybody excited. And they had a picture sleeve and they had a picture of somebody looking mysterious. And it's like, no, actually, it's the guy from the police. And no, actually, this is being put out by Miles Copeland, whose father was one of the people running the CIA. And Miles ah. Copeland had, had a huge amount of money and they had uh, small wonder records and whatever, and they, they were an indie label, but they had they a the, lot the, of money. They were, wow. not the same. they were not the same as the real indie labels who were doing it for love. I mean, my, my good friend, Nicky Sudden, you know, they, yes. the Swell Maps, they really were doing it all themselves. They booked the studio time, They put their own records out on their own label in 77. Um, but there were too many. There was even a Radio One DJ who pretended, a guy called Mike Reed, he pretended to be a punk rocker and he put out a single called High Rise in about 1979 um, under an assumed name. And it turned out he was, he was about 30 years old and a Radio One DJ. You know, so that's why interesting looking things in picture sleeves stopped selling um, in the same way. But in 77, you could sell anything <laughs> because the industry hadn't caught up. And um, yeah, but by the, the, your original question was what happened with Vinyl Japan and, uh, and John Peel. Basically, John, for tragic reasons, wasn't there anymore. Uh, Vinyl Japan was a great record label that was putting us out. It was putting the head coach, the head coaches, mm -hmm. a lot of interesting stuff out. And suddenly, you know, we'd all been making one album a year for these people, plus maybe four singles. And that was just gone. And damaged goods were around already. And they picked up the rights to some of the stuff that had been on uh, Vino Japan. Yes. And so they have taken up ever since then putting out, so Billy has always had damaged goods putting his stuff out, mm -hmm. and so has Holly from the head coat tees and, and so on. But um, 
Ian, I know Ian from Damaged Goods. He's a nice guy, but for one reason or another, he's he's not uh, necessarily a Flaming Stars fan. I think he appreciates what we do, but he doesn't want to release our records. So, you know, that would have been a natural home for mm-hmm. us. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just one of those things. You need, if you're, if you're, say you're a band of teenagers right now, uh, it really helps if you've got a label that wants to put your stuff out and it helps if you've got a manager. We never had a manager, but you look at the history of a lot of the great bands who really got somewhere. They have a manager who absolutely, uh, he's in there, he's on the phone every day trying to get the press to write about things, trying to get them gigs, just trying to make it happen. And often also putting his own money into buying, you know, amplifiers and stuff for the band. And, uh, you know, it's no, it's no surprise that the, the Sex Pistols had Malcolm McLaren and the, the Clash had Bernie Rhodes and, uh, yeah, you know, there was, I, I wouldn't have fancied a manipulative manager like either of those, but even so, um, it helps. It helps. It really helps. In our last conversation, uh, you mentioned that there were some unreleased radio sessions by the Flaming Stars. Please, if yeah. you, please, please, if you have any recording of them, uh, let me know because I would love to, to hear them or if it's possible and the BBC doesn't kill me uh, to play one song from them of my show. Will it be possible in the f- near future uh, to see them release or maybe some live uh, shows or, on Bandcamp uh, of the Flaming Stars? Well, the, the, the problem is just that uh, any BBC session mm-hmm. is owned by the BBC. So when we put our first six Peel sessions out, That cost a lot of money. That was a very expensive ah. record to do. And so the other sessions, we did probably another, um, maybe six or seven different sessions for various BBC shows. I, I have it here. And, um, no. Yeah, yeah. This one. This one this is, this yeah, that's the one. Great. It's great. Yeah, thank you. There, there should, I mean, there were another two John Peel sessions. Then we did, I think, a couple of sessions for uh, a great DJ. Uh, and he was, he was most famous. He was a stand-up comedian. And unfortunately, he died suddenly a couple of years ago. A guy called Sean Hughes. And um, we did, I think, two sessions for him. We did maybe three sessions for another radio uh, BBC DJ called Mark Lamar. And um, I think there might be a couple of others somewhere, but any of those, it would be, it would be tricky uh, because I think if you played them um, on your show, that um, would be, that I would know. be difficult because the BBC is everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, a copyright infringement. I don't know if it's okay, yeah, uh, yeah, that's not, yeah. but, uh, Uh, um, it's like w- when you put something in YouTube, instantly the algorithm says, no, this is a John Coltrane song, you have to pay and then you, you have to write and yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's too much to bother. But uh, I would love to hear them <laughs> if you have, if you, if you have uh, or at least uh, if you have um, any live recordings. I have uh, three, uh, g- three gigs recorded by someone in Berlin. He sent me the, the Flaming Stars show. They are very good. And I played, uh, I, I think I read, um, The Light Pours Out of, uh, pours out of Me, uh, the, the magazine cover you yeah, did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's a very good b- version. And sadly, it's, it's not uh, available in any of your uh, singles or LPs. So yeah, we, only, we only ever did that live. We used to do, um, we used to do um, 10 feet tall and then keep the drum beat going and then turn it into the light. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, but yeah, I've got, I've got some good, I've got some good live recordings. I've got a, uh, actually a great live recording from uh, 
a very early show at the Dublin Castle here in London, 1995. Wow. And in those days, we were still doing a couple of cover versions in the set. So um, uh, we do um, we do mostly our own songs, but we do Blank Generation by Richard Hallam and Boyd Wow. And, um, I, I've never and, listened to that version. I've never listened to your yeah, cover. And, uh, no, it's, it's, it's not available anywhere, but I can, yeah, I could, I'd, let me find something and send you something that, yeah, you, you're welcome to play something like that on your radio show. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Because, because uh, one of the main reasons that I'm trying to do this radio show is to say, look, uh, here is this great band. Uh, the first Flaming Stars song that I played was obviously a, uh, the face on, on the barroom floor, uh, barroom floor, sorry, um, because uh, very few people know know the, the band. So then I went to the to to, uh, to to more deep cuts, and I think that's the that's the that's something that I w would like to do with a more well-known bands. Like okay, now you know the Ramones. I'm going to play you a, a bootleg or a demo of the Ramones, so you know that. Yeah. Uh, there are other things that you can search uh, about these great bands. Um, oh, that's, that's cool. Actually, the, the gig that I just mentioned, the Dublin Castle show, that was uh, the show we did. That was the launch, launch party gig for that single, Face on the Bar and Floor, the, the second, uh, sec our second single. Uh, so, yeah, that's August 1995. Um, I'll send you something from, from that. Thank you so much. She's not here, she had to go I don't know 